In 2013, Paul Kalanithi was a promising neurosurgeon nearing the final days of residency. Then a terminal cancer diagnosis changed everything. In an instant, the man behind life-saving surgeries was now helpless to cure his own illness. His struggle is documented in the book, When Breath Becomes Air, a memoir written by Paul but completed by his wife, Lucy, who picked up the writing when Paul could no longer do it. And what a message they share. In just a moment, we'll speak with Lucy about her life with Paul. But first, we go to Trace Gallagher for more on their incredible story. Trace? Megan, Paul and Lucy Kalanithi met during their first year of medical school at Yale. They later married and moved to California to begin their residencies. He at Stanford, she at UC San Francisco. In the book, When Breath Becomes Air, the Kalanithis acknowledge that before the diagnosis, their marriage was struggling. When Paul realized he was sick, he writes, quoting, We sat on the couch, and when I told her she knew, she leaned her head on my shoulder, and the distance between us vanished. Despite the diagnosis, they decided to have a baby. Elizabeth Acadia was born in July 2014. Lucy wrote about the implications, quoting again, I fear it might make his death so much more painful if he had to say goodbye to a child. Paul's response to her, well, wouldn't it be great if it did? Paul later wrote to his daughter, you filled a dying man's days with a sated joy, a joy unknown to me in all my prior years, a joy that does not hunger for more and more, but rests satisfied. During his undergrad at Stanford, Paul Kalanithi studied literature and dreamed of being a writer. And despite the physical suffering, he continued to write. And Lucy kept her promise to finish the manuscript and shepherd it to publication, writing in the New York Times, quote, and now now as I prepare to watch Paul's work take on a life of its own, I begin to take on a life of my own. I've learned that the timing of bereavement, perhaps like the initial stages of falling in love, is utterly unpredictable. She says she can no longer comfort him, but the other vows she made on her wedding day stretch well beyond death. Mm. Megan. Trace, thank you. Dr. Lucy Kalanithi joins me now. She's a clinical assistant professor at Stanford School of Medicine and the white wife of the late Paul Kalanithi, neurosurgeon and author of When Breath Becomes Air. Lucy, thank you so much for being here. It is such a beautiful story and so powerful in so many ways, giving everyone thoughts about life and death and what we're doing here and Paul's search throughout his whole life for the meaning of life and of death. Did he find it? You know, I was talking with a friend of Paul's recently who said something I really loved. He said, I think that Paul felt the struggle to find meaning is the meaning. Um, and I kind of think that's true and I love it. Yeah, I, I, you, that, that jumps off the pages. This is a man who, in addition to going to Yale Med School, studied literature at Stanford, uh, studied the history of medicine at Cambridge, and, and was in a nonstop search to better understand death, only to find time after time in the academic setting, the details were unknowable. It wasn't until his diagnosis that the light started to go off for him. Right. Um, you're right. He's, he was really interested his whole life in mortality as sort of an intellectual, philosophical problem. And then he wanted to grapple with it. So he entered medicine to be a doctor. And then at age 36, he himself was diagnosed with terminal cancer, as you know. And so suddenly it was a very personal, emotional challenge mm -hmm. for him. And the two of you are growing together, med school, it, you know, it's so challenging. And he writes in the book about the moment, the diagnosis, and I mean, it's a less than a 0.01% chance that a 36-year-old man is gonna wind up with this kind of terminal cancer. And he writes in the beginning of the book, I flipped through this, the CAT scan images, the diagnosis obvious. The lungs were matted with innumerable tumors, the spine deformed, a full lobe of the liver obliterated, cancer widely disseminated. I was a neurosurgical resident entering my final year of training. Over the last six years, I had examined scores of such scans on the off chance that some procedure might benefit the patient. But this scan was different. It was my own. And even you, a trained doctor yourself, looked at him and asked, do you think there's any possibility it's something else? And he told you the truth. No. Right. I mean, 
right? I really remember that moment because we looked at the scan together. Nobody delivered the news slowly. We, we were both doctors, and so we pulled up the CAT scan and looked right at it, and we could see cancer throughout his organs and his spine. And um, one of the first things Paul said was, he said, I want you to remarry, and it was so beautiful and surprising and an immediate recognition of what we would be facing and the fact that we each wanted to help each other through all of it. He writes about how he talked with his mm -hmm. doctors many times about, he, because this is, you know, he was on the top of the top of the top of the heap. I mean, the, the, the best, most promising neurosurgical uh, do, resident and then doctor they had. And so he wanted to continue working and yet wasn't sure if this is what he should do with his time he had left because he also wanted to write. Uh, but you talk about how, how much he, he worked in the book saying he worked tirelessly to secure my future and I worked tirelessly to secure his present and even to the point where you you finished the book for him initially he went back to work and then he became too ill to do brain surgery and he started writing which was his lifelong dream and he died while he was working on the manuscript for when breath becomes air and I wrote the epilogue to the book and I don't consider myself a writer but it felt like an urgent important thing to describe how Paul died and then to reflect on his life and and what's been going on since mm -hmm. the way he died is oddly inspirational I mean, usually we say the way he lived, but the way he chose to die and handle his dying somehow makes you a little less afraid of it and somehow inspired by him. The way you put it when you wrote the epilogue was this, for, so, for much of his life, Paul wondered about death and whether he could face it with integrity. In the end, the answer was yes. I was his wife and a witness. Yeah, um, I'm so, it's so lovely to me to hear you um, describe your experience of reading the book. And you're right, at the end of his life, Paul faced a really difficult choice about whether to prioritize quality of life or quantity of life. And people write to me and or tweet at me, and it all feels like a eulogy or a condolence letter or this really personal connection with people over what Paul's decisions and writing meant to to them in their lives. Well, I have been personally inspired and I know my team here feels the same. I'm so grateful that you shared his story, that he did as well. What a parting gift for us all, especially little Katie. God bless you. Good luck to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All the best. Mm, pretty amazing story.